Good morning, one and all. Today is tax day, 2016. And what that means is that it's the deadline for sending in our tax dollars to the IRS. It's also the day of global action on military spending. And I wonder if you see the connection between tax day and an action against military spending. Of every tax dollar we mail into the IRS in the expectation that it will be spent on what we call the common good, the government spends 50 cents and more, depending on who figures out the discretionary budget, on building of island and world-dominating war machine. I don't think that's the common good. This global day of action on military spending is building something quite different. It's building a broad consensus of groups and individuals who are clear that the huge power of our drones and our bombs is creating terrorists and the terrorism we claim to be stopping. It's well beyond time to transfer funds from the bloated and obscene military budget to meeting human and environmental needs. Move the money. Bring our war dollars home. War doesn't work unless human and environmental degradation are the goal. My name's Rosalie Paul. I work with PeaceWorks and Peace Action Maine. Peace Action Maine's focus is on nuclear abolition and also with the move the money away from the Pentagon campaign, both of which fit their theme of creating a climate for peace. It's a nice choice of words. On Friday this last week, members of PeaceWorks in Brunswick stood outside the post office handing out a small little flyer, looks like this, and it opens up to be that large banner showing the 2015 federal budget discretionary spending, like that. And people were, with a very few exceptions, very glad to have um, this flyer. And um, they let us know that they were really well aware of how out of kilter our federal budget priorities are. We have several people here this morning ready to talk with, with you about their perspectives on this subject. Lisa Savage with the Maine Natural Guard. Notice the Maine Natural Guard. Is here to talk about the dollar costs of war to the state of Maine and the impact those dollars have on the environment. Lisa? Thank you, Rosie. I'm uh, Lisa Savage. I live in Solon, Maine. I'm with the Maine Natural Guard. And um, our organization has a pledge, which I invite anyone to take, which helps connect the fact that the Pentagon is the biggest polluting organization on the planet. Their carbon footprint is bigger than any other single organization. And mostly, of course, they're fighting for access to oil and other fossil fuels, and they create a huge amount of pollution doing that. And they also uh, create radioactive pollution, sonar that harms animals in the sea, and many other kinds of toxicity for living things. So the Maine Natural Guard, if you'd like to join us in bringing attention to that fact, we'd love to have you sign our pledge. Well, what I've really been asked to talk about today is the cost to Maine of the uh, federal contribution to the Pentagon each year. I want to clarify what exactly amount of money I'm speaking about before I tell you all the other things that we could afford to pay for if we didn't give the money to the Pentagon and its contractors. So this is a fiscal year 2015 uh, total Pentagon budget, the numbers I'm going to be talking about this morning. And that does not include the slush fund for wars or the overseas contingency fund, if you prefer. This is just the base budget for what some people like to call the Department of Defense, and I prefer uh, just to call it the Pentagon. It also does not include, which many people are not aware, it does not include the Veterans Administration. VA benefits are a completely separate budget line in the federal budget. And I would like to make it clear that while I do not like recruitment and sending people overseas to uh, fight in our wars, I am absolutely in favor of caring for providing medical care, education, 
housing benefits and whatever is needed for veterans who have uh, made a, a contract with the government and do deserve to be taken care of when they come back. So the amount of money I'm objecting to is not has nothing to do with uh, caring for veterans. So I did a little homework online and I used the National Priorities Project. This is a great nonprofit that crunches the numbers of the federal budget each year. And you can look at many different things on there um, to find out where your federal, or federal tax dollars are going. So for fiscal year 2015, the state of Maine contributed $1,483,450,119 federal tax dollars. For that amount of money, they could have instead provided more than 28,000 households with solar energy for 10 years and given 11,000 low-income people health care for 10 years and given 14,000 low-income children health care for 10 years and given 6,500 university students full scholarships for four years and paid 7,500 elementary school teachers for a year and provided 2,200 Head Start slots for children for one year. All of those things could have been paid for with what Mainers gave to the Pentagon budget. I teach in a very low income area up in central Maine. There are children in my school district who literally do not have heat at home, do not have running water, are food insecure. I see Rita Clement nodding her head. She also teaches school in a different part of central Maine. It is criminal that we are not taking care of our families here in Maine, but instead are making Pentagon contractors very, very wealthy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. Richard Clement from Veterans for Peace, Portland Chapter 001, is here to talk about some of the costs of war we may not be fully aware of. Good morning. My name is Richard Clement, and I am president of the Tom Sturdivant chapter of Maine Veterans for Peace, VFP. This chapter won the founding chapter of Veterans for Peace. Veterans for Peace was started here in 1985 by a handful of vets who were disturbed by the militancy of the United States and its violent interventions in the affairs of other nations. We have become an international organization made up of military veterans, military families, and allies. We accept veteran members from all branches of service. We are dedicated to building a culture of peace, and as part of our statement of purpose reads, we work to increase the public awareness of the true costs of war. Our networks are made up of over 120 chapters across the United States and abroad. We have chapters in Vietnam, the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Mexico, with a national headquarters located in St. Louis. So part of the true cost of war is your taxes going to fund the bloated military industrial complex. Your taxes fund the Pentagon, where a massive black hole sucks money into black ops that have no oversight. A Pentagon run amok with no accountability. The Chief Financial Officers Act of 1990 and other laws require that federal agencies pass an independent external audit every year. By the Pentagon's own admission, it cannot properly account for how its money is spent and still has never been audited. The true costs of war are figured by those killed, injured, or sickened by these wars that our taxes support. Iraq and Afghanistan have seen over 6,800 U.S. military men and women killed and well over a million civilians. As of March 2014, nearly a million new disability claims had been registered at the VA. The true costs of war are not left on the battlefield. For the money that we taxpayers spend on war, we could pay the teachers of our children what they are really worth. We could fix the crumbling schools our kids tried to learn in. We could fix our roads and bridges and infrastructures that has been neglected for so long. We could lift people out of poverty with decent jobs and housing. We could eliminate homelessness, which is disproportionately made up of veterans. As a Vietnam era veteran, I received medical care at the VA. As an Iraqi war veteran, my son receives medical care at the VA. Many of my fellow vets, my brothers and sisters, receive care at the VA. The true costs of war are visible on the wards 
and in the halls of the VA hospital. We need to inform our elected officials where we want our tax money spent, and when they don't listen, elect somebody new until they finally do. One final thought on the very true costs of war. Veterans are committing suicide at the rate of 22 deaths a day. Just this week, I learned that a family I know, to mom and dad, recently lost their son when he hung himself. We have to find a way to do better. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, Michelle Fournier from 350 Maine to talk about their work to create green community. My name is Michelle Fournier. I'm a volunteer with 350 Maine. Um, we are a grassroots organization working to grow the movement for climate justice in our state. So as you know, the military is the world's largest institutional consumer of petroleum products and a source of greenhouse gas pollution. Uh, numbers are hard to come by because of reporting exemptions, uh, but a U.S. congressional report stated that in 2011, the Department of Defense consumed 117 million barrels of oil, only slightly less than all the cars on the road at, in Great Britain that year. And to put it another way, um, the DOD's consumption alone could have taken up 39% of the now canceled Keystone XL pipeline at maximum capacity. 830,000 barrels per day would have taken up 39% of that. Um, so the numbers are staggering, of course. Um, but as you know, the, pr the problem runs much deeper than that, um, the, the, the carbon footprint of the DOD. Um, Nick's Buck Nick Buxton writes, um, the military is not just a prolific user of oil, it is one of the central pillars of the global fossil fuel economy. Today, whether it is in the Middle East, the Gulf, or the Pacific, modern day military deployment is all about controlling oil rich regions and defending the key shipping supply routes that carry half of the world's oil and sustain our consumer economy, end quote. Um, the US invasion of Iraq and our military support for privatization of oil resources there is just one blatant example. Um, the Pentagon has recognized the potential national security implications of climate chaos. And earlier this year, they ordered their top commanders to incorporate climate change resilience into everything they do. Um, the DOD also has a goal of sourcing at least 25% of the energy consumed at their facilities from renewables by 2025. Um, this is a positive development, even if they're doing it for self-serving reasons, like reducing their reliance on foreign oil. Um, but think of how much more they could be doing um, in conjunction with decisive government leadership. Uh, our friends at the Climate Mobilization are advocating strongly for a World War II scale mobilization to re restore a safe climate, um, drawing a parallel between the rapid home front mobilization then and the dramatic change of national priorities we need now to transition rapidly away from a fossil fuel based economy. Um, but 350 Bain believes that the change needs to be even deeper than this. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. called for a revolution in values against the giant triplets of racism, militarism, and materialism. We need to recognize that the systems of oppression that are causing the climate crisis share a common root with these other justice struggles. Uh, in that vein, I hope you will join me on May 14th in Albany, New York, where we will put our bodies in the way of the fossil fuel industrial machine and say it's time to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Um, there's no justice, there's no peace in our future without climate justice. Thank you. I'm Bruce Gagnon from the global, is the coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Bruce. Thank you, Rosie. It's great to be here with everyone. I live in Bath. This militarism, this endless war that we have today, not only benefits the corporations who are extracting resources. The Pentagon has essentially become the primary resource extraction service for corporate globalization, but obviously benefits the military industrial complex as they make massive profits from endless war. The field I work in, space, where we see incredible sums of money, massive, massive, $100 million a year being spent on space technology 
the destroyers made at Bath Ironworks, where the new Zumwalt destroyer is costing $4 billion and rising, as recently there were reports that the over, cost overruns on the Zumwalt are ever, ever rising. In fact, there will be another christening, so-called christening of Zumwalt on June 18th, and we'll be there protesting again, making all these points that are being made today. The Navy says they can't afford these ships. They can't afford the new aircraft carriers that they want to build. They can't afford the new nuclear submarines that they want to build. They can't afford to even put the nuclear missiles on the nuclear submarines. They can't afford the F-35 fighter plane that is also having major cost overruns and apparently has all kinds of technical problems and isn't flying properly. The list is endless. And so there's only one way then to pay for all these massive cost overruns in this endless war cycle. And that is to continue to cut social programs all across the nation and to continue to defund the physical infrastructure of America. The time has come for all of us to call for the conversion of the military production system. Unite, uh, UMass Amherst Economics Department has long reported that military production is the worst way to create jobs in the country because it's capital intensive. And when that money is used on anything else, we get more jobs. In fact, if we were building rail systems at Bath Ironworks, the UMass Amherst Economics Department reports, we would double the numbers of jobs at Bath Ironworks. You'd think every politician in the state would be calling for this. Why aren't they? Instead of having to drive from Bath to Portland uh, every day to work, my partner would be able to take a commuter rail system and not uh, be destroying the environment as she comes to work. Our biggest problem on this planet today is, in fact, climate change. And the only way we have a chance uh, for the future generations to survive is if we convert the military-industrial complex to help us deal with climate change. Thank you all very much. Jenny Schneider with the um, War Tax Assistance Resource Center in Maine can tell you about ways that you can withhold your support from the military. My name is Ginny Schneider. I'm the new coordinator of the Maine War Tax Resistance Resource Center. I have big shoes to fill after a 30-year stint by Larry Danzinger and Karen Mary's daughter, two terrific activists I've known since Karen was the coordinator of the National War Tax Coordinating Committee more than 20 years ago. Thank you for attending this War Tax Resistance Gathering today Annually, for more than 30 years, the National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee has promoted War Tax Day actions across the country to help the public understand the connection between our tax dollars and the militarism that it funds. These actions have grown so that now Peace Action and the American Friends Service Committee, through its GDAM's online registry of actions, are both encouraging War Tax Day actions as well. My understanding from Larry Danzinger is that by last year, Maine War Tax Day actions had dwindled to five or six. I decided to try to double that number this year and go for 12. We may actually have reached the goal. I'm still waiting for a report from the field in Bangor. In any event, we had tables and leafleting at least at at least 11 sites across Maine this year. I think more than any other state, if you go onto the Nutric website and check it out, that's the nwtrcc.org website. This is terrific. One of our goals was to begin to have a presence with youth through tabling at schools and a youth and militarism program. During war tax season, we tabled at University of Southern Maine in Portland, University of Maine Augusta at the Changing Maine event, twice at University of Maine Orono for War Tax Day and the Hope Festival, and for six weeks running at University of Maine Machias. 
The energy and excitement of the tablers and leafleters has been terrific. They have become familiar with all the fabulous materials that are produced by the National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee, which you can see and take from the table today. We're getting the word out that you do not need to wait to do something. You can take personal action and divest from the Pentagon. There are legal and illegal ways to do it. Feel free to see me about it. I can also hook people up through Maine, throughout Maine with war tax resistance counselors who can talk with you about the choices related to divesting from the Pentagon. Thanks so much to each of the speakers. You can see there's a lot going on in Maine that's raising awareness and um, giving us opportunities for activism, which is really um, a wonderful spark. I hope that lots of you will pick up and find ways to get involved. Something that every one of us can do, since this is campaign season, is to ask tough questions of every candidate. Remind them that we know what happens when we value muscle and money more than cooperation and compassion. We're there. That's where it's brought us. And um, perhaps it's finally time to remember what William Penn had to say some years ago. He, he asked, let us now see what love can do. Thanks so much to everyone for being part of this. Michael has a song. Come and sing, if you will. I'm lay down, sword and shield, down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Gonna lay down my sword and shield. Down by the riverside. Gonna study war no more. Study war no more, I ain't gonna study war no more. 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 Gonna lay down those nuclear arms. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Gonna lay down. Study war no more, I ain't gonna study war.